Welcome to part two of our interview with Christy Summer of Soul Sisters Paranormal about the Haunted Exchange Hotel. Let's go into the investigation and, and the night that you go in there uh, after the initial daytime walkthrough. Uh, how do you get set up? What are you? What, what's what's that like? What are your first experiences in that investigation evening? Well, we go in with a couple of, uh, of, of different legends and, and reports in mind. Um, there were, again, those, those four suicides that I mentioned with the nurses um, that couldn't handle it. So we kind of wanted to see if we can make contact with them. There were also reports of two children that were in the house. One uh, is a girl by the name of Emma, and one is a boy by the name of Jeremiah. So we had trigger items uh, such as glow-in-the-dark balloons. We had some glow-in-the-dark balls. Uh, that we were going to use to try to to, uh, to to interact with them. And uh, we also had reports, again, of the major in the summer kitchen and uh, a couple other apparitions that they either attribute to being doctors or um, soldiers, the entities of soldiers that remain in the house. So we basically set up uh, cameras in every room of the, of the house, night vision video cameras, and then we left um, voice recorders in most of the rooms of the house, in uh, of the main house. And then in the summer kitchen, we had uh, three um, night vision video cameras and two voice recorders that were set up and they ran throughout the night. So when we go to these locations, we set up everything initially and then everything runs for the duration of our investigation. So whether or not we're in the room, we have those things running. Um, uh, uh, we also have body cameras on so we can monitor where we are all at and we can get a, a time stamp of where we're at. And um, so with that in mind, we, we started our investigation that night. And, um, you know, we did, use, like I said, we used those trigger items and we had questions that were um, that we wanted to pose to anybody that was a hotel guest or anybody that was a former um, doctor or soldier that may have had some interaction in the house. So we were armed with those questions. And um, for the most part, we spent most of the night in, in groups. So there was uh, teams of, uh, there was one team of three and then uh, one team of two. And uh, we had some, <laughs> some very interesting uh, uh, interactions that night, um, both uh, what we think is residual and what we also feel is, um, was intelligent. Um, so for example, there's a room in the house called the Bagby room and this was on the second floor and it's set up to look like the, one of the hotel rooms so there's a large I think a uh, full-size bed in there and then a, uh, a clawfoot tub and there's a fireplace it's a gorgeous room uh, it's tall ceilings and such so what we had done is we had set the night vision video camera on the the back headboard of the of the bed to cover the entire room and we had set a voice recorder down in the middle of the bed and for us, this is it was it was pretty cool because during the night we had a, one of our teams of three was upstairs. They were in the second floor, but they were not in that room. They were across the hall. And um, during the night, we caught a child's voice saying, "Hi, this is my bed." And we took that to 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 mean that he was talking to the voice recorder that was left on the bed, saying, "Hey, this is my bed." And to us, that still remains one of the best EVPs that we've we've captured in any of our investigations. Um, to us, it was very intelligent and acknowledging that something else was on his bed. Who was the um, child that you had the interaction with? Do you have any ideas? Is there any story? We be- yeah, we believe it was a child named Jeremy, and um, there there are there are reports of uh, of a child of, of a male child named Jeremy and a female child named Emma. That is that were believed to be um, two children that had perished in or near the hotel. Um, a lot of guests or day tour um, uh, guests or other paranormal investigators have experienced the, uh, excuse me experienced these same children, and uh, so we believe it was Jeremy that had come in and, and said, uh, "Hi, this is my bed." And you know, to us, when we get a child's voice or a male's voice it's very easy for us to rule out one of us because we're all female. Mm -hmm. And like I said, there were only three female in the hotel during the time of that EVP capture. Um, And I can't explain that. I can't explain a child's voice captured on our voice recorder. And it is, it is crystal clear what this child is saying. Um, So to us, that was a very cool piece of evidence. (laughs) And then um, a couple hours later on that same uh, voice recorder, 
we got a male's voice. Um, he was very emphatic. It was a male's voice that says, I don't know. I'll be back at 430. And to us, it is either somebody who is catching a train because the trains did run on a tight schedule. He was either catching a train at 430 or it was a surgeon saying that he's coming back to do more operations at 430. But uh, again, it was that was the second best EVP we've ever captured on any of our investigations. When you have uh, trigger objects and things of that nature that are being used to try and get interaction from the other side, is it always uh, only intelligent spirits that can manipulate the trigger objects or can a residual, if you're in the right place at the right time, essentially manipulate a trigger object just by chance because they're there uh, and it's happening in, in that specific area? Does that make sense? It does. Um, for us personally, most of the interaction that we've had with all of our trigger items have been uh, intelligent in nature. Um, so, for example, when we use we, we really use cigarettes a lot because we go to prisons, we go to forts, um, uh, you know, those those areas where, you know, men would smoke cigarettes. We get a lot of interaction off of the cigarettes. Um, we've had a lot of interaction off of water. Um, and, and we've gotten kids' responses off of water as well, just leaving a cup of water um, and acknowledging that it's there for the entities that are there. We get a lot of thank yous. Um, we get a lot of I see, um, something like that in response. So to us, just for us personally, we get intelligent responses with our trigger items. Every now and then we'll get a residual, what I would consider a residual, um, and I would probably say the Mont Barker house um, was like that when we put some bullets out. Um, I think it was just it just kind of triggered, you know, that that response. Um, but uh, to answer your question, most of it is intelligent for us. Okay. What were some of the other trigger items that you had used that uh, during the investigation in the house, and, and what did you find? Mm -hmm. um, as I said before, we had uh, a lot of glow in the dark objects, mainly for the children. Um, we had some glow in the dark balls, uh, just little about the size of golf balls. And uh, it was kind of, it was kind of interesting because um, my, my team member Kim and I were sitting um, along a long hallway. So she was on one end of the hallway and I was on the other. And we were just sitting there and we were rolling the ball, one of the glow balls back and forth. And I had a K2 meter in front of me and Kim had a K2 meter in front of her, kind of sitting off to the side. Um, I'd say probably two feet away from us. And, uh, you know, we would say things like, if you light up my K2 meter, I'll roll the ball back to Kim. And the K2 meter in front of me would light up. And then Kim would get the ball and uh, she would say, if you light up my K2 meter, I'll roll the ball back to Christy. And her K2 meter would light up. So we, we continued that game for probably about 15 minutes. And uh, to us, that was very interesting. And we think it was, again, the, the spirit of Jeremiah that was kind of interacting with us and wanting to, to roll the ball back and forth. So that was a big one for us at the exchange. Um, we, uh, we had a couple of, um, of trigger items upstairs in the summer kitchen with the major. Um, that's where we left some cigarettes. And we also had a, a small shot glass of whiskey that we had left out, you know, just thinking that men of those times would, would probably want some libations, uh, especially in a tavern. And, uh, and then downstairs, we had left, um, we'd left some matches because we figured that uh, uh, the, the cook there, Anna, the spirit of the cook, would probably use those um, if she was to start a fire to cook and stuff like that. Um, so we'd left those. And, uh, and yeah, that's, to my recollection, that's pretty much all we had left in that, in that area. What is the thought process when leaving out food or drink for a ghost? This is something that comes up quite frequently and i understand it as being oh look there there's something i'd enjoy if, if you're speaking on the part of the ghost uh but are i mean this is completely an opinion-based question um are they aware that they're not able to pick up that glass and drink it or eat the food if it was food was it was put out um it, what is it about it that, that seems to work for being a trigger item? Or is there a way that they're able to experience these items, do you think, just by the fact that they are there? For us personally, and again, I'll just speak on my own behalf, mm -hmm. what I think is going on is 
it's an acknowledgement. It's an acknowledgement, acknowledgement by us that says, hey, we understand that you used to live, that you used to enjoy these things, that this is something you probably partook of, and we're going to leave this for you as an acknowledgement of your past existence. And because of that, we would like a response. Um, and this was very big for me in, uh, in when we went to the um, to Fort Mifflin. They had a, a, a solitary confinement cell there where a gentleman was in, in, ensconced in that solitary confinement cell for a couple of years. And, uh, and suffered some horrific conditions during the Revolutionary War. And so we left uh, a, a, an open cup of water. We don't leave a water bottle. We actually put it in a little glass. And so we left a glass of water and we left a cigarette. And when we went back in, there were just two of us. When we went back in and I said, you know, we left you some, some water and a cigarette, we got a very clear thank you. And again, I feel like even though they can't partake of it, that it's just a recognition that we were doing something for them and he was going to, going to acknowledge it. Now, we have had reports from other paranormal investigators that, you know, uh, that cigarettes do, that entities can manipulate that. So there was one in a prison that we went to, another paranormal team was telling us that they put a lit cigarette on the uh, on one of the jail cells and you could watch it being drawn down like somebody was, was sucking on it or, or, you know, inhaling on that cigarette. We have not had that. Um, you know, none of us smoke, so we don't light the cigarettes. But to us, it's just an acknowledgement um, that, hey, we, we recognize that, that you're here. Mm-hmm. Do you find that having the trigger objects, I would assume the answer is yes to this, but you tell me how <laughs> how a difference it makes having a trigger object when you're trying to get an interaction uh, versus not having one. Um, I think it does elicit a response when you have them. Um, again, it's just that acknowledgement. It's something that they would be familiar with. Uh, you know, for example, going back to Fort Mifflin, everybody had water you know um so that is something again that that we feel we leave as an acknowledgement um i i i can't really speak to what others do but for us we always go in with some type of expectation that we will use a trigger item um it may not be in every room it may not be in every cell or hallway um but we have had a pretty good response rate when we take them um and so that's just something that has always been in our playbook Mm -hmm. When going into a place like this, um, it, it, as far as, as getting uh, interactions from the other side, uh, other than trigger items, what sort of, of questions mm-hmm. do you find work best when when trying to communicate with the other side? Is it more so just trying to get identities? Is it asking about uh, events that occurred? What what sort of things do you find and, and how do you, do you have kind of a set set of questions that you tend to go to or, or are they very specific to the uh, the investigation in the area that you're looking into? Pretty much both. Um, we use both types of questions, both general and very specific. We do a lot of research before we go to any investigation. Um, every one of us on the team, there's five members on our team, and every one of us uh, have an advanced degree. Uh, mine happens to be in criminal justice. So I kind of use that as um, a, that, that background as to kind of do a lot of research into what would, uh, you know, elicit a response for us. Mm-hmm. Um, so we go in with very, like I said, set questions, um, and, and it, it's very germane to the location. And then we go in with questions that, that I feel would elicit a response simply because, you, you know, the human nature is to talk about yourself. Um, us as humans, we want to tell about ourselves. We want somebody to acknowledge that we're here. Um, I mean, the fear of being left alone or the fear of not being remembered is a very valid fear in the human existence. So I feel that kind of carries over into the spiritual world. Most spirits will want to tell their story. Most spirits will want to get that acknowledgement that you, that you care and that you want to know about their history. So we ask questions that are really specific um, to the entities that we feel would be there, but then we also broaden it out to be more general to the location. So, for example, when we went to the Exchange Hotel, you know, um, obviously, the are there any soldiers here? You know, can you give us a sign that uh, of, of what your name is, or um, was your name this? Could you interact with our our, our K twos at that point? If if you're the major, can you interact with us? Um, 
so, you know, to kind of long-windedly answer your question, we go in with both general and very specific questions. Quite often, uh, we hear, and, and I think for quite a, a while, when it comes to paranormal investigations or communicating with spirits, there's this very human uh, or, or living assumption that the spirit wants to move on uh, no matter what. <laughs> it's like, well, we must help them move on. That's why they're here. And, and and I don't know that that's always the case, but that, you know, that seems to be what, what we as people or, or a, a good deal of people seem to feel this must be why they're here and they want to communicate. Uh, is that the case ever uh, w- when you're out there and, and you're you're trying to get their story, you're, you're trying to hear uh, what happened? It goes back to the being remembered thing. Um, one would mm-hmm. assume that if they got their story out and they're being remembered, that then, oh, it's so simple. Now they can go to the light and move on. Uh, but <laughs> in the cases where we have... Um, essentially paranormal tourism now where investigators mm-hmm. investigators can go in and, and rent a place out and 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 these ghosts can essentially tell their story seven nights a week if it's booked out that much uh they're not necessarily moving on after their stories are being told over and over and over again um other than than getting their story out uh when people are are, are inquiring and and they're trying to to, to do this um what what is the purpose of, of them haunting these locations? Is it just where they're at? Are they just as confused as we are as to why they're there? This is an opinion question and kind of deep, but give me your thoughts on all that. <laughs> no, it's not. And I actually get that question a lot. And, you know, for me personally, to answer the first part of your question, I don't go in and, and try to cross over a spirit. Yeah. I don't think that's my place. Um, and I, and I don't, I will never use the word haunted to describe a location. Again, that's not my place. I don't own, you know, the Exchange Hotel. I don't own the Ma Barker house. That's for the owners to decide if they want to put that out there. What we do is we go in and we will put forth evidence that we can't explain. So, um, you know, for us to say, oh, it's haunted and I'm going to go in and cross something over, that's not what we do. Uh, I just, I don't feel, again, that that's my place. If a spirit wants to stick around, that's their prerogative, I feel. Um, for As to why a spirit would stay, I think there's a couple of reasons. Um, you know, for children, I think that they may be confused, that they may not know that they can move on or they're waiting for something. Um, for for example, when we went to the Hales Bar Dam um, in Tennessee, we got a very distinct child's voice that uh, when we asked the question, um, why don't you move on? we had a voice, a child's voice saying, I can't. Um, and to me, that was one of the most heartbreaking EVPs that we have received so far, because it, it's saying that for some reason he can't cross over. I don't know whether he's being held. I don't know whether he's, um, he's confused or lost. Um, I, I don't know that answer. All I know is I got the answer that I can't. So for, like I said, for a child, I think it may be that they are confused. They're not really aware of what's next. But then you go to like a prison, like, for example, um, West Virginia State Penitentiary, we had a very interesting interaction with a spirit of what we believe is a, um, a, of a, an entity named Red. And he was, you know, the guy in the prison at the time. He was a murderer. He was on death row. You know, he had when he wanted another inmate killed, they would be killed. So he was the big man on campus, essentially. And I think for his spirit to stay, he wants people. And he loves interacting with people. Um, he wants to be there because that's where he was comfortable. That's where he wants to stay. And uh, he has no problem not crossing on. I mean, if you're a big man on campus in life, maybe you're the big man on campus in death. And uh, so I think it's a personal choice of that matter, um, whether or not to go. And, and the next one is, I think they may be scared, uh, mostly for prisoners and or those that were in, like, say, a mental institution or in a sane asylum. Um, they're scared of what's next and they may not know that if you cross into the light, there's redemption or, or, you know, whatever, um, that, that they just don't, that they would rather stay in this, this realm, if you will, this in between realm rather than crossing over because they just don't know what's next. And they'd rather just stay here where they know rather than cross over. That's my opinion. Sure. It's always interesting to discuss this with people who are very involved in it. Is it ever the role of the living to cross over the dead? Uh, You could argue that that some people who have 
no ability to you know you have your your some out there you know the ones that uh what's what's the name the guy who had the show called crossing over john edwards um you have individuals and i'm not not saying that he's legit or not i'm just speaking in terms of, of individuals uh, who who do legitimately have that ability? Because um, I, I believe there are people out there that legitimately can communicate with the other side mm-hmm. on a level much deeper than than a lot of us can. Um, so I, I'm not questioning whether that exists or not that ability. But I guess I, I am uh, asking: Is it ever even even if they have that ability to communicate on on that level? Uh, do we have a right on this side or, 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 or is there an obligation if you have that skill to, to help those on the other side, do whatever it is by meaning cross over, uh, because I think that can mm-hmm. have a 500 different definitions as well. Um, <laughs> it, or, or is this something that really is strictly on the other side? This is for them to figure out. It really isn't something that we as the living, uh, can can manipulate or, or, or have this thought mm-hmm. that we have a role in, in that process? Mm-hmm. And, and that's a great question. And I have to honestly say that I'm mixed on my answer. Um, if, if, if I hadn't heard the child's voice at the Hales Bar Dam that says I can't, mm-hmm. I would be of the, of the camp of, you know, it's not up to us to cross us over. Yeah. But if there is an entity that legitimately wants to be crossed over like this child, um, I would absolutely say give him, you know, the guidance that he needs, but I wouldn't say go into the light or force him into the light or, you know, it, it's time for you to move on. Uh, I do, like I said, I do believe that some spirits will pick their time when they want to go. And I'll give you an example of that in a second. But uh, my answer is mixed. If, if there's a way for that child, like I said, it was heartbreaking for me to hear that EVP. And if there was a way to get that child to cross over, I would absolutely say go for it if he wanted to cross over. Um, you know, back to my, the, the story that I have as an example, um, a, a couple of years ago, I had a very vivid dream um, that my granddaddy had come to me and my granddaddy died in 1986. And he came to me in a dream about two years ago and uh, he spoke to me and he said, I'm waiting for your Nana, my grandmother, I'm waiting for your Nana, you're gonna get in, be getting a call soon. And uh, about two weeks later, we did get a call that she had been in an accident and she never really recovered. So she ended up passing about two months after that accident. And um, on the day that she passed, uh, because in the dream, he was in a very specific location in the house. And uh, on the day that he passed, on the day that she passed, um, I told my sister, who is also a member of my team, I said, Nana's going to meet granddaddy at the house. We need to go over there and see if we can communicate with them. So with the permission of my family, Jenny and I went over and, um, and, and now the electricity had been turned off in the house, so there's no electricity. And when we first got there, there was nothing happening on our K2 meters. And uh, when we got to the spot where I had the, where, it, it, where it was in the dream, when I, we got to that spot in the house, our K2 meter started going off. And I said, Granddaddy, are you here? And the K2s went off. And I said, man, are you here? And our, we got a positive response from the K2 meters. And we had this really interesting interaction with both my Nana and my granddaddy. And, uh, and I said, are y'all crossing over? And we got a very positive response. Um, and to me, that brought me a level of peace. We went back about a week later after we had buried her. We went back a week later and we, we did not get any blips on the K2 at all. So in my mind, my granddaddy had waited for my grandmother. And when she passed, they both moved on together. Mm-hmm. So in a very long-winded story to answer your question, I think that my granddaddy waited. He waited for his time because he was waiting for my grandmother and they both passed on together. So if there's examples like that that are still out there that, you know, somebody is waiting for somebody else or, you know, they're waiting for a specific time, then that's their time to decide. It's not for us to decide when that time is going to go. Because, I mean, I wasn't going to tell my granddaddy, hey, go, if he's waiting for my nana. Mm-hmm. So. And, that's, just, that's just a personal example. Yeah, and in that personal example, that that makes sense. Where it's okay, mm-hmm. they're they're waiting for their spouse to 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 pass to to go over together. Um, I guess that it gets more trivial than when you have the spirits where there is no one from their lifetime that is living anymore, mm-hmm. and it's like, well, what mm-hmm. are they waiting for? 
Are they just curious? Do they really want to see what the new iPhone is? They're the same almost every year. <laughs> and it really is something they're never going to get to do. Or, or what is their purpose? Uh, you know, or, or, or is it something where they are stuck uh, and, and they don't know and they're confused as to the time period and maybe whoever they are, whoever they, they think they're waiting for, they are unaware that, uh, mm-hmm. that they have passed where maybe time doesn't matter so much on that side. Mm-hmm. Well, and again, you know, that goes back to my mixed answer. Um, you know, I, there, there are times where I feel that if I have that ability and to help uh, an entity cross over, um, you know, I, I would do that. Uh, like I said, the, the child in the, uh, the, the dam would be my prime example of that. Mm-hmm. But if it's not, I, I'm, I wouldn't say go into the light. You must go depart, you know, whatever other terminology you want to use. I would put it, the onus on them. Hey, if you want to go into the light, here are some some tools. Here's what you can see. Here's what you can do, and and kind of leave it up to them. Because um, I feel that they are intelligent enough to communicate with us on EVPs, on manipulating trigger items. Then they're intelligent enough to understand these these guidance um, methods, if you will, to go into the light. That wraps up part two of our interview with Christy Summer of Soul Sisters Paranormal about the haunted exchange. Hotel. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Until next time for the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for supporting the show and thanks for listening.